Hi, I'm Paul Gasper, Director of Small Business at UPS Canada. And this is a series of short small business talks with small business owners and supporters of the important ecosystem. Today I'm excited because I'm connecting with Yamila Franco. She's the co-founder and CFO of Nyoko Design Labs. And she's here to talk to us about her experience as an entrepreneur and the impact of participating at this year's Canadian Export Challenge. Emila, glad to be with you here today. Yeah, super excited to be connecting as well, Paul, today. Thank you for hosting this. Perfect. We'll, uh, we'll jump into some questions. And of course, I definitely want to understand how your experience was with the Canadian Export Challenge itself, uh, just so we can obviously have others that are considering to pitch uh, to try to get into the finals or even next year, uh, just to get some ideas to what your experience was like. But before we do that, uh, we definitely want to make sure that the audience understands who you are and, of course, who Nyoka Design Labs is as well, too. Obviously, uh, you are a regional finalist. Uh, you won the BC and North Area region for the startup. So you've got a great product. So again, let's hear a little bit more about you and the business. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, I think uh, when it comes to my story, personally, I have to start all the way back home. So I was born and raised in the Dominican Republic. And thanks to my engagement in the community, my supportive teachers, my school principal, when I was in the DR, I was in Notre Dame school, I was nominated for a scholarship, which allowed me to come to Canada and study biology. And so before coming, I was super engaged in the areas of sustainability, United Nations. You will always find me in the debates, um, learning about different policies, etc. So when I came to Canada, I was convinced that I was going to save the world, starting with the environment or with community and doing all these amazing things. For example, when I was back in school, I would always be doing some crazy big research projects. However, when I started learning about science, two things happened. One, I found myself outside of, outside of the, the university classroom. I was engaging more with the university community, whether it was creating community for uh, newcomers, international students, and also doing a lot of work around activism. And then in the classroom, I was really sort of going into this dark area of sustainability where it felt like there wasn't a lot we could do for the world. And you know, when you start realizing what are the impacts of climate change, what's happening with plastic waste, we've got microplastics everywhere. It really felt like I didn't really have a lot to do in that area. And for a little bit, I really almost gave up. And then I got really excited about science education and science literacy. And through that literacy uh, piece, I ended up meeting uh, the person who became my co-founder and her name is Paige Whitehead. And so Paige, uh, being born and raised here actually from Courtney, Paige had been super engaged with the festival scene, also with environmental activism, and really, um, you know, with bigger music festivals, what she actually told me is that even though you find that people really care and they have this consciousness, you find so much waste after festivals and so much plastic waste. And so it was counterintuitive. You have people who care about the environment, but at the end of a, of a great music festival, you realize that there's so much environmental impact. And not just that, what happens with that waste afterwards? Is it even being recycled? Or is it just adding to the pile that goes into the landfill and the environment? And so at that moment, Paige had come up with the idea of the world's first earth-friendly glow stick. So using bioluminescence instead of toxic chemicals to, to power it, can we design something that could replace and disrupt the current plastic music industry? And that was really the start. We connected um, because we were both finalists in a competition where she presented her idea and her first invention. And we started working together from there on and started you know, learning about business development. Uh, in my case, even though I graduated from biology, I had always been, like I mentioned, attracted to activism. And in a way, I was an entrepreneur. And I didn't realize it at the moment. And what I ended up blending all of my skills and love with education, with activism, entrepreneurship then became for me uh, like a way of, you know, really rising and creating something against all odds. Even though in class I was hearing that, you know, the world is in such bad hands, I really thought, well, if we can come together and create something bringing different ways of knowledge, different ways of working, even with our products, with the design process, then you know we can definitely change the future, and that's how we started. <laughs> wow, 
a great story. And, and I do remember hearing uh, a little bit of this uh, during the export challenge as well, too. So uh, great to see that you brought that international flair and partner with someone who is uh, more local Canadian and, and having that passion together, we're able to uh, obviously introduce a, a product that is very interesting. And I know you mentioned it a little bit there, but um, let's dive a little bit more into the actual product uh, that you've designed uh, and what it means, uh, not just for your business, but what it means to the, uh, um, you know, to the uh, people that will use it, but obviously also to our planet. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it was so interesting because originally we were so focused on music festivals and we realized that's definitely a challenge. And when it came to doing customer discovery, so talking to people, understanding what they thought, we realized that conscious consumers would actually or were super interested in accessing an eco-friendly alternative. And when I say eco-friendly, you know, there's so many products out there, but something that's definitely can be either recycled or compostable, or that can be taken away from harming the environment. And so the question then became, how do we create something like that? And that's where Paige, with her experience in permaculture design uh, principles, which is, you know, bringing that uh, more earth-based knowledge into our current practices. You see, a lot of times we waste so many resources with how we create um, our current products, with shipping, with packaging. And in a way, it's even a financial loss. It's a loss for the environment, for the world, but even financially for businesses right now. Because if they change the way that they saw the sign, you know, you realize that waste can be or is a design flaw. And so ultimately with our first product, it was really looking at how can we get rid of all this design flaws by looking at more traditional knowledge and more learning from the environment. Fancy word being maybe biomimicry. And what I like to mention as indigenous knowledge as well and bringing that mm -hmm. from ways of us gathering knowledge, from ways of us learning, uh, and now what we now identify being a circular economy model where we look at the design of every step along the way of our product. And we asked, you know, again, how can we reduce or simply take away the waste? So we're not harming or creating another layer of impact in the world. And ultimately, can this be a framework that other businesses can follow? And, you know, originally we started with the Nyoka Light Wand, which is the world's first earth-friendly glow stick. What we realized is this same principle can be applied to so many other products. And then we thought, what about packaging? And I was so happy that we had our first Kickstarter. It was a limited run this year and we sold out, you know, in 48 hours, I think we had actually sold more than half of the packages, but even with our packaging and how everything was organized inside, we weren't using plastic. And so at first it was those initial steps that were harder to figure out what steps do we need to take in a business to reduce uh, that environmental impact. And uh, one of our strategic goals is now actually following this framework, but making this framework available to other organizations, to other businesses who are also innovating and disrupting the usual ways of us doing business. So what does that mean for the world? Well, something I mentioned in the pitch is that just yearly, it costs about 100 to $150 billion to recover plastic waste from packaging alone, from oceans and rivers. And that's just a little small portion of the packaging. In fact, plastic packaging loses about 95% of its value after we, we use it once. That means we have 95% of it that literally went down the drain and eventually, you know, again, ends up in the ocean, ends up in the landfill, we don't recover it. So what is it about this wasteful living? How is that even considered smart? And as we move forward, you know, we think about advancing sustainable development goals, about actually creating thriving communities, about, uh, you know, again, you know how I mentioned that this is my activism because I'm so passionate about it, but it's because I realized that the way we were living wasn't um, something that we could sustain long term. And maybe we can sustain it in our generation, but what about the generations to come? And so that's how from a glow stick, we then uh, grew to being at the sign lab and realizing that we needed to come up with other products and other systems and which were already in place. It's just that they weren't maybe being so widely spread in business. Mm -hmm. So it's about pulling that into the mainstream, into products that people are using. And instead of changing people's behavior, we bring that change internally from our business operations. You know what? Um, and glow sticks was obviously the the specific product that you 
uh, were discussing uh, during your pitch uh, at the regionals. So if you don't mind, I'd like to dive into that a little bit more because um, you talked about your connection with the co-founder, Paige, and uh, it, it was the, the whole festival scene. Uh, and of course, at festivals and events, uh, Gold Sticks obviously is, is a namesake uh, and definitely an, a product that, that you see there. But I know when you presented, one of the things that you shared, shared with us, which was a, a bit of an eye-opener for myself, was, you know, Gold Sticks are not just for the entertainment and fun, but they're obviously used uh, uh, quite a bit from a day-to-day -day necessary uh, from a survival perspective with, you know, firefighters and uh, other sort of key uh, industries as well. Can you sort of maybe discuss that a little bit? Because, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounded like you were sort of going down that path, first of all, of trying to resolve that issue from a festival perspective. When do you sort of realize the size of this industry, specifically for glow sticks, and the impact you had in other parts uh, and other industries that utilize the same product? Yeah, thank you for asking that. So when it came to to the festival, I think it was pretty pretty accessible for us because we both come from a festival background, me in the Dominican Republic, where I've seen it, and most people have. It's easy for consumers to relate to that. But then, you know, when you expand your vision and you're not just trying to solve the plastic problem in the festival industry, we had to ask ourselves, where else do these glow sticks come in hand? Like what other, and not just glow sticks, what about the components that make up the glow sticks? And you have the, you know, the chemiluminescent uh, toxic uh, glow product inside the glow sticks are just used outside of the glow sticks. So it was really breaking down the product itself. And we realized that this toxic products and also wasteful were being used in, like you mentioned, search and rescue industries. Mm -hmm. We hadn't thought about it until we really dove to do the market research and doing thorough uh, business planning and even strategizing. And that's something that opened our eyes. I personally started learning more about it through doing accelerators and incubators programs. My last accelerator was uh, League of Innovators. And that's where we started understanding that also pivoting was, uh, was just a common thing that we do in business. And it was great for us because we had a business plan and we knew we had some market research. Well, this is a bigger industry, but we can start with music festival, which is smaller more accessible. We have those connections, but then coronavirus happened and we were like, what are we going to do? However, that push that took us outside of our comfort zone actually led us to expanding our team and forming a research team that is now focusing on getting our first product market ready to go into that search and rescue, which you can imagine is highly regulated. Also for going into the military industry. And a lot of times, you know, um, I just want to address this right now because people ask me, why do you want to work with the military if it doesn't align with your values? And really our values are aligned with you know, we want to disrupt the plastic industry. And that goes with tackling whichever industries are currently engaging with it. And the majority of the users were in humanitarian aid um, in the military in search and rescue. And so really that pivot for us came with the pandemic itself. Uh, whereas we had already kind of looked into the, the research and into the markets. And, and that's great. And the reason I wanted uh, you to explain that, and I'm glad that you did was, uh, when I'm fortunate to talk to a lot of entrepreneurs like yourself uh, who uh, have a product that uh, they really believe is going to support an industry, when they do the work they, like you did and all that research to try to break down what they're doing and what they're trying to bring to market, so many times I've heard entrepreneurs tell us that uh, they realize that there's a whole lot of industry that they can uh, support or improve with the product that they have. Um, uh, that is replacing an existing one, or in some cases, bring something completely new to another industry that was never even considered before. So, I mean, this is a prime example of, of that, where it's obviously utilized elsewhere, but it wasn't your primary focus. But doing your due diligence, you realize that there's, uh, there's this huge opportunity there uh, to support your cause, grow the product, and at the same time, do right for, uh, for the planet. So uh, hats off, to, obviously, to both of you for, for doing that. Uh, let me pivot here a little bit, if it's all right. Um, we talked about uh, the fact that you're a regional winner uh, for the uh, BC and North Regional uh, Canadian Export Challenge startup category. So congratulations. Uh, I know later this uh, week uh, you'll be uh, pitching to, uh, in the finals and good luck. 
but what I'd like to know is, um, what was your experience like uh, at the Regional Export Challenge? Um, not just obviously pitching throughout the day, including into the finals, but uh, if you were engaged in any other components throughout the day, was what what did you feel that day was like, and you know, and, and uh, what would you like to share with the audience watching? Yeah, so I know that a lot of times people get so nervous. I get super nervous when I'm pitching, to be honest. And it was so weird because being able to pitch from a place where I felt comfortable already, like my office, and if I was in Courtney at the moment, we were in our maker lab, it actually made it more accessible and made me feel more comfortable. My major concern was actually the internet. I was afraid my connection was going to drop. <laughs> we had uh, Paige actually brought like an additional connector just so I could have Wi-Fi in the computer. Uh, but you know, besides that whole experience, I think I was so excited at first and I was so energized that after the pitching happened, I crashed. And that's when I actually started experiencing all of the emotions of being nervous. And I ended up just laying down on the floor answering emails while I was also celebrating calling home calling my mom calling the whole team that we had won but this is where I guess this is the first time I'm going to share this story no. and I hope it's okay but it's good for people to know stories too but earlier this year I made it to the finals of a national competition in Canada I'm gonna I'm not gonna say what it was it was a great experience I connected with young entrepreneurs it was awesome, but when I was at this stage and when I was in the environment, somehow I felt so out of place and I felt so lonely and disconnected mm. from the community itself that I was having some serious like imposter syndrome and some serious just concerns about how was I going to share and pitch? Was I going to win or pass? And I didn't win the nationals. I made it to the finals though, and I did a great job. But just having that in the back of my head, was for me when I reflect back on that is it goes from that sometimes that sense of uh, being in a space where sometimes you don't see yourself represented or where you wonder it's like is this actually the place for me and so being able to do it from my office well, actually took away that worry that if I had been in this huge stage you know with people super and I love dressing up but super dressed up you know, I think there's some additional pressure that, especially for new entrepreneurs, um, for women, it also comes in play. And that was taken away when I had this experience. So I ended up having so much fun and I ended up dancing and crashing and being happy and then using this as a, as a push. And, you know, the most beautiful part was that the whole team came together. We have a Slack channel. Our team is all throughout Canada and we have interns from around the world and we had people that it was midnight in their time zone and they were watching the pitching competition and messaging in the Slack channel and being so excited. So it was a beautiful bonding experience as well. And for me, it felt very empowering. I'm glad to hear that. And I know that um, uh, not just UPS, but obviously Startup Canada will be glad to hear the same because obviously we've been doing this pitch now for several years, but it's always been uh, live in the regional communities across the country. Um, so obviously with this year in the pandemic, uh, we had to take it virtual and we weren't too sure how it would work. And obviously there was a lot of work that was done to prepare it. And um, I, I know that as a participant uh, at each one of the regionals, I was very impressed with the way how everything ran. Uh, so it's glad, I'm glad to hear that someone who obviously participated as well too, uh, felt that there was a comfort level uh, because there was still an element of of some familiarity uh, with your own space uh, while you're obviously online and, and trying to compete. So again, a great, great to share that with, with everyone and, and good information for us uh, as uh, hosts of uh, this event to know. So thank you for that. Uh, I think I know what was your favorite moment for that day. Uh, I think that's quite clear uh, with winning the, the challenge. But uh, throughout the day, uh, was there a, a biggest challenge, something that um, uh, and maybe it's, again, it's, it's, uh, it was the internet connection, but, but was there something else that you thought throughout the day that you thought, wow, this is something that next time around, uh, I know I'll be more prepared for that maybe you would like to, to share with, with the group. Yeah, for me, my, my biggest challenge, and it's about how I share the story. Uh, to be fair, when there's so many things happening in the company itself and there's projects and there's products that we want to launch that I haven't even mentioned yet. 
And mm -hmm. it's about how do I actually bring a narrative and how do I highlight those key pieces that will capture the judge's attention and that will show that we have traction and that we have um, you know, interest from people from around the world and that, that we are looking for this um, type of support, et cetera. So for me, when you give me 90 seconds to tell a whole story of work that we've done for years, of the impact that we've had and that we've been tracking, it's extremely challenging. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something I see a lot with social enterprises. It's not as simple as we are solving this problem for these people because of this. It goes as, you know, we have impacted this many people by solving this problem, by diverting this X amount of plastic tons from the ocean. And so when our business, especially that is built on so many pillars of impact, and for us, we co-create our solutions. So we really engage the team. We are strong advocates for education, and that's a part we haven't even touched on, but there's huge outreach initiatives we do. And then there's the, through our product design and bringing the circular economy model. So how do I touch on all of those things? And I bet there's other entrepreneurs out there when you have so much that you can share and that you value, and we have to break it down to the key points that are going to get your message across, which is in many cases, I have a viable business model or I have a product and there's demand for that product or I am scaling up or I'm growing really fast and this is uh, why I'm in this competition. So personally, before pitching, and this is something I had forgotten, I was, I shot everything off because people were messaging me and talking and I was already nervous, but I was just reading the pitch and trying to imagine myself from somebody, from like your perspective. Like, what is somebody going to understand? Do they understand what circular economy is? Do they understand the importance of that? Do they understand, you know, um, permaculture design? Is that something I mentioned? And I think that's actually my biggest challenge in any pitching competition is about how do you carry out the essence of your business and your idea without leaving, um, leaving important parts behind, especially when we're built by our team. It's a huge part. Like I could speak about my team for hours because everybody plays such an integral role, but I can't bring them all to the pitch. Mm -hmm. And what about our families who've been supporting us? Like, so I hope this makes sense. It's about all of these little mm -hmm. pieces that go into a business. It makes perfect sense. And it's the one thing I hear from every single pitcher over the last couple of years. So every single individual that's pitched for their business, uh, those that, you know, made it to the finals, that those that, that won, uh, those that didn't, uh, it is, you know, who is the audience uh, and how do I um, ensure that my elevator pitch, my, my, you know, 60 seconds, 90 seconds, two minutes, is uh, going to provide all the information they need. And, and I'll share uh, a, a little bit of a secret uh, with yourself and obviously everyone that's watching as well too. For us as judges, uh, the time frame is our challenge as well. I can tell you that uh, every single time my experience has been with all the other judges is there's always a few more questions that we all wish we could have asked each one of the different pitches, right? Uh, I can't remember which ones were for you, but, but I, I know at the end we're like, we wish we had more time to ask Yamila this question and the other businesses as well too. A couple more questions just to know a little bit more. And, and that's the trick. Uh, and, I, and I think this is a bit of advice for those watching that, you know, you really need to be prepared uh, as best as you can to know who your audience is and how much time you really have to make sure you say the right words because uh, again, the idea of what you're doing could be phenomenal and it could be attractive to a lot of people, but if it's the time you're given, it's not communicated the right way, it could be missed. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that as well. Um, we need to give some advice to those that are watching. So uh, you participated obviously in the export challenge. Uh, so what advice would you give to other small business owners, or entrepreneurs that are considering uh, pitching in the future uh, to, uh, to try to improve their success rate. Yeah, so I think that for successfully pitching or for entering this space, I think it really takes a lot of work on behalf of not just the founders, but the whole team. 
in understanding what value you bring to the world. And one of the key pieces of value in my case, if you remember, it was, for example, bringing this data storytelling, where I'm not just speaking about the environmental impact we're having, but also the financial impact of how much money can we save if we were to switch. That's a key there. Uh, that I think it's so important and that will get me to invest in a company. So uh, one thing I usually advise people, can you put yourself in the position of an investor? What would you like to see in a company? What will make you make a decision easier or more easily? What information do you need to know? You need to know if this is, if you have a team that can lead the company, is this a viable idea? Or And again, Pinpointing those things when you're sharing, I think it's so important. That goes back to communication and storytelling, but you have to know your company first. And you know, whether that is starting with what are your whole values and doing that with your team, maybe identifying what is your value proposition, what makes you different from the competition if there is, you know, maybe you're new, maybe you're a pioneer in that environment, but that's also valid. And you know, speaking on that, I think sometimes we get so used, let's say we're doing something amazing. We get so used to being in our own space that when we step outside of that, it's like, oh yeah, you know, I'm an inventor, big deal. It is a big deal. I think we also need to acknowledge that the work we're doing in our businesses, especially uh, those that have a positive impact are a big deal. And we need to be able to I mean, humbly, but also not being afraid to share how awesome our businesses are, our traction. Um, really, when pitching, it's about not being so humble, leaving all that on the side and going out there to impress. And personally, I like to think about it as like, you know, what if my kids were watching me or this is a video my children will watch in the future? I want them to be proud of me. And so I just visualize myself like, what do I want my children to see? And so the same question goes to you. If somebody else watches this, what do you want them to feel? You want them to be inspired, to be moved, to realize that your business is doing X, X, and Y. But if you don't share that, and if you don't understand your business from the start, then it, it might, it's just going to be more challenging for you. So it's sort of like even the self-discovery process. And when you're able to, you know, articulate that, properly. I mean, that's when you start attracting people, not just investors, not just judges, but people who align with your mission and your vision and who also want to help you. They can connect you. They can invite you to the competitions, uh, among other things. So that's, that's a few pieces of advice. Wow. You know what? Well said. Uh, so good. thanks for sharing that. Uh, I've got one more question for you. Uh, in, uh, in a few weeks, uh, obviously, we'll uh, have the uh, national finals for the uh, 2020 Canadian Export Challenge, uh, which uh, you are obviously one of the finalists at. So um, looking forward to uh, winning this competition, what would it mean for you and of course for your business? So uh, for us, and I've been thinking a lot about this. In fact, I'm going to answer on behalf of my team because this was a discussion we had when we were talking like, oh my gosh, like this is what it seems we could get. Well, I'll start with one of our major challenges. And the reason is because we're working with innovative solutions. We are in the process of licensing, patenting. We have advisors. Um, we have interest. We get emails of people asking, organizations just cold, just reaching out to us to figure out where we're at. And so being able for us to connect with, with this whole organization, this whole ecosystem, and actually have a dedicated team uh, pushing us forward is a catalyst. We are, right now, we're working so hard to build our business structure, to build systems, so that when we receive that catalyst, whether it is through winning this competition or through another competition, we are ready to go, that we're ready to run. And that has been a huge focus for us. But what it means for us is, you know, is instead of having to learn by making mistakes, uh, we can directly go and find people in the field, whether it is in exporting to other countries, in securing those contracts and the procurement process, which we're already navigating, but we can only know so much. And even with our current advisors, a lot of the work we do is meeting people and asking questions. And it's not necessarily people that stick with us for a long period of time. I think that's where we are lacking, uh, specifically that we need to secure more of that, uh, you know, industrial level of support that's actually going to catalyze our, our manufacturing, our production, our exporting, et cetera. And so that's what I foresee that can happen from winning this competition. That's why I'm also so excited 
because again, we are actually setting ourselves up for success, whether it is now or in the next one, but we are building that structure so we can access those things. Wow. Emilia, I feel like we can talk all day. <laughs> so thank you for everything that you've been uh, sharing. And of course, thank you for joining me today as well. Uh, now, I hope your experience will inspire other entrepreneurs to, you know, to consider participating in the Canadian Export Challenge uh, as a way to get their business out there and to grow. And of course, congratulations on your success. And I'm looking forward to uh, watching your business continue to grow as well, too. So uh, all the best of luck for you on that. Uh, now, for everyone watching, remember, uh, UPS is here to help, right? So from our end, we continue to look for new ways to deliver new solutions and support to keep your business moving forward. That includes a dedicated web page that we put out earlier this year, which is ups.com forward slash comeback strong. That provides both advice and offers to help businesses get back to focusing on growing their business. Uh, so if you need to reach out for us, please do so. And we're here to help. Uh, with that, I want to thank Emilia again, and I hope everyone enjoyed this session. Until next time, thank you. Thank you.